Thank you. Um, I hope nobody came on February 12th, um, and I myself couldn't help but be glad that I wasn't in Toronto where the weather was much worse. But um, thank you all for coming, and thank you um, to Mark and to Green College and to the funds from the J.V. Klein Endowment. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Who knew that the trolls and the miners were going to arise from new technology to threaten our world? I have a friend who's writing a book about AI, artificial intelligence, and its power and its limitations. We debated last month whether his title should be The Threat of AI, The Promise of AI, or the anodyne, the future of AI. One of the pioneers, Jeffrey Hinton, explained to me a couple of years ago that both Brexit and Trump owed their victory to Cambridge Analytica, <laughs> and that as a result, many people would suffer and even die. And if you were following the news this afternoon, you can see that Britain is wasting much more time than anybody thought was possible. <sighs> and it's very bad. You don't need me to give you a survey of the articles, both the gloomy ones and occasionally the sunny ones, about the future of our society when our data is mined and the trolls attack every passerby. If your own taste in paranoia does not run to conspiracy theory, then even so you must at least engage the challenge of fake news and fake news and the astonishing capacity of AI to sell you all the news you want true or false. The ability to disseminate and tailor news to the reader to go well beyond Photoshop and produce false images and false videos, this all seems at least to challenge our basic sense of truth and the task of learning how to discern truth. I cannot offer you a lecture about this crisis, nor even about truth itself. I can frame a part of the problem, and as you expect, I can raise key questions about how the university relates to these changes. Because I'm no expert on information technology, much less AI, I will offer you a quite different path tonight. The seeming disorder, or plural order, of the internet and of our knowledge, more and more delivered digitally, changes the landscape for science and for study itself. Our understanding of knowledge and communication on one side mirrors the technology we develop on the other side. I will rehearse a story that tells how our ideas of unity governed our views of truth, our idea of unity governed our views of truth and of science, and reflect the ways we read and write, and vice versa. We will explore a new idea, one of discord, and we'll see it emerge embodied in our new practices of reading and writing, and with the idea of discord, a new task arises for the university, different in kind from the tasks that serve the idea of unity. In my first lecture, I focused on the students, on where the students are helping to engage the land acknowledgement, which I would again like to cite. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. By contrasting an idea of isolation and an idea of permeability, I proposed that we recognize that our vast number of commuting students could embody a much more intense educational experience of knowledge exchange with society, indeed with the urban culture where they live. Indigenous research has helped lead the way in framing research as depending on complex partnerships with knowledge that is land-based and resides not on the university. Where the students are offers us a chance to make flows of knowledge move in both directions. The first lecture in the first lecture, I described what I mean by ideas. And I offered this chart of ideas that are in play in these three lectures and in the book manuscript I'm revising. An idea here will be something that exceeds our experience and gives it direction, 
like a goal, a vision, a norm. An idea guides the work of an institution with its own organized series of practices. This interpretation of ideas does not view them as eternal. Any idea for a university is deeply historical. Indeed, we need ideas to renew the university. And so we need to set familiar and traditional ideas into a dialogue with newer ideas, or ideas that offer new resources for thinking about the goals of higher education. Some of the ideas I discuss are traditional, ideas of knowledge, of critique, of unity, of freedom, of isolation, and of replication. Those other ideas, the ones that are in red, arise from a set of thinkers, most of whom are Jewish, and who had quite tensed relations to the universities of their time. The set includes Hermann Cohn, Emmanuel Levinas, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Gabriel Marcel, and Franz Rosenzweig. My interest lies with their unusual ideas for higher education. A call to the future, present in the question of the students, generates this set of ideas. And those ideas engage with the more traditional ideas to help us envision the renewal of the university. The new information technology is dramatically changing our universities. How does the university relate to this revolution in information? How will we study? And again, the focus here is on the students, those, as I said in the first lecture, addicted to or engaged in study. I leave aside for here how faculty conduct their research and how data is archived and privacy respected. And today, instead today, I focus on higher education, on how people study and learn, and how study itself changes with the changes in technology. And again, I look to ideas to understand these changes. Tonight, I will have a greater emphasis on the humanities. I also leave for now the challenge of assessing how both natural and social sciences follow or lead the issues in the humanities. The university, in the light of the idea of knowledge, has been, has, was seen, sorry, for centuries as the repository of information and the guardian of access to it. Higher education meant higher access to information. But information now is massively accessible. If the university exists only to store and to transmit tradition, then it is doomed. The role of the professor seems now to be reformed, often dramatically. For many who defend the humanities, the focus now must be on the idea of critique. We replace the role of gatekeepers to information with judge or critic of information. Let's begin with the model of the university deeply connected to the library as archive and bound to the idea of unity. We might call this the model of an encyclopedia in which all knowledge is contained and organized. Those of you who know something about the German universities know that in Berlin and in other uh, German universities in the 19th century, encyclopedias were very important for the formation of the university. Or, alternatively, we might think of with it as a model of transmission of tradition. For, the, for the humanities, this image, this model, has an enduring allure. If you didn't recognize them, at least you can see the quote. We may think of this image of Aeneas, the hero of Virgil's Aeneid, who flees the conquered to Troy with his son and carries on his back his father, who is holding the household idols, and marches off to Rome. Here is a concept of heritage, of transmission, of translation from Greek into Latin, from a past world into a present. Is this the task? of the humanities. Save classical culture and its values for our future experience and teach our children to be virtuous. Loaded down with the past and the gods of the familiar, the study of arts and letters then would make us better, new inheritors of venerable knowledge. This story about our need to study the past is one some rally around in this moment of crisis. The university serves as a reliquary in contrast to the fast track of commercialization. This account of Aeneas is not a Greek or even a Trojan image, but a Roman one. 
This is the story that the Romans told about their ancestors, and by that telling, they reframed their heritage at the moment of the dramatic and uncontrollable change of the Republic into empire. But the role of Virgil in our past, the author, is also not stable. Would we be here if the British had not elevated Virgil in framing their dreams of empire? Here we see the work of critical reflection. It produces for us then an unstable Trojan past, an unstable Roman past, an unstable modern European, European imperial past, all discerned by studying the humanities, household gods or idols. But at each turn, we teach students to read in order to learn something different from the past from the retellings of the past, from the history of the retellings. The humanities does not carry the past like an object, even a divine object, but in a circle of tellings brought forward into our moment as they themselves were brought forward into futures that are now, but only unstably, unstably our past. Let me now return to the compelling challenge to the model of the university as the institution that stores and transmits knowledge. That image of Aeneas arose when information was harder to access for both technical and political reasons. One can see that this idea of transmission and curation changes dramatically with the advent of printing in early modernity. My question, however, is not how should the university make use of our new technology? but rather what will now constitute higher education? What kind of learning is worthy of a degree in our time? Anyone on the upside of technology can access vast information on anything they want to learn, even including YouTube videos of lectures from our professors, even from me at Green College. What is going to justify the university's role in education? The transmission of knowledge, for better or worse, will occur in contexts outside the control of the university, bypassing both the preserved and curated knowledge of the university and the expert knowledge held by only a few professors. If I circle back to the humanities, then I can focus again on how will we read and write. I want to consider two different models of graphic designs in scholarship. The commentary page and the humanist page. These two models engender two quite different modes of reading and writing. While I can claim to locate a transition in scholarship with early modern editions created by the humanists of the 15th and 16th centuries, the historical record is more complicated. But in our moment, I suggest, there is a comparable technological and design change underway. What I'm hoping to identify here is the emergence of a kind of study and scholarship that is most familiar to us, humanist, and distinguish it from a mode of scholarship that is less comfortable, commentary. Will we be able to invent, to renew and revise study and universities in the wake of our change? The Gutenberg moment has been much considered and perhaps over-theorized for some time. And the story of the humanists themselves is much celebrated and has been reevaluated by critics. The version that most interests me is the shift in reading practices, not merely something that can be cast as democratizing or even commercializing, but even more as transforming the authority of the scholar and the way that one studies. The epistemological shift was captured or rather generated in the new page, an innovation in design linked intimately to both the new printing and the new text critical scholarship. The result was that study and the temporality of reading as well as its sociality shifted dramatically and the past was engaged in a remarkably different way. The university too changed. I begin with a traditional page, one with commentaries and notes. We have here a 1576 printed version of the Babylonian Talmud. 
What is obvious at a glance is the page has many text blocks. If I had a marker, I could do it, but I think you can probably follow it well enough, and I'm not actually going to read any of the text to you. Some of the texts are commentaries, others are hyper-commentaries. Who can read such a text? It takes much schooling. Each page bears a wealth of diverse knowledge, not subordinated nor narratable. Indeed, the page presupposes a library of other books as well as a school. In Jewish scholarly traditions, such a text was usually studied by a pair of readers, sharing one copy of the text. Even in print economies, it was not distributed to a mass reading public. It's not hard to see why. A parallel Christian commentary tradition would be the iconic Glossa Ordinaria, with top billing to Nicholas of Lyra in a print edition from 1498. The printed editions begin in the 15th century. The original editions go back to, the, to Nicholas in the 12th century. Here, too, are a wide range of text blocks, translations, commentaries, glosses, teachings, and so forth. Here, too, are a series of interlinear glosses set in Latin alphabet. There are more than a few echoes of manuscript pages and formats, and the pages are in some interesting ways actually enhanced by movable type. Chinese and other commentary traditions also have similar formats in different periods, and I'm not trying to tell a strictly linear story here. Simply put, scholars often have had a preference for a page that places the text under consideration in a sea of commentary, notes, glosses, translations, and so forth. This is a type, you'll forgive the pun, of page study and scholarship. What interests me is the similarity of these multiple text blocks and the vitality of the commentary on the same page. Manuscripts did do this too, but it's not surprising that movable type is also a very good way to compose such commentary pages. Hence, the design of the page is not simply determined by technology. Let's consider the kind of learning and thinking that occurs in studying such a text. Past readers obtain a mode of authority over the contemporary reader. One does not approach the original text, itself often a narrative or an account of past events, in isolation from a series of readings. The scholar does not simply repeat the primary text, but rather rereads the commentaries. And some of those commentaries are commentaries on other commentaries. Some are cross-references. Does reading require engaging all of the text on the page? Is it not rather a process of finding a visual path to draw together some portion of the information, either by following a path set by a teacher or improvising with one's own interest or insight? The information, in short, is graphically presented to facilitate different paths on each page, an opportunity to do different kinds of readings. Moreover, the core text itself is but a small part of the whole book or treatise. There is a non-narrative quality to all to what is on the page. Time is organized differently, in some ways without an efficient structure. And perhaps more importantly for our purpose, the re-readings re of past readings offer leverage and critical perspectives on the very readings on this page. Here is the kind of thinking we can call higher education, in contrast to the schooling that transfers settled information. It's not a unified field. It's one that harbors disagreement, reinterpretation. Current readings do not replace earlier readings in a celebration of progress, nor is the text the heritage of an eternal and static past, where at some time the truth was captured. To read with a variety of past interpreters is also to seek a new reading. To, re to the history of the word invention has a rich background in reading and in rhetoric. Prior to our sense of new machines and processes, it often meant a quest for new interpretations. We see on the page the waves of invention and criticism. And the readers, is this a text that one studies by oneself, for oneself? There is a sociality on the page that was often repeated in the classroom or study house. Just as the text is constructed to be intertextual, so the study practices also 
interpersonal. Some in the room may have been teachers and authorities, others may be novices. And this kind of study, it takes a long time. In a Talmud class, one page might take a week. There's no single truth to be found from each page. And yet, in this social form of study, the exchange of the readers illuminates the exchange of the readings on the page. There is inquiry. This is a specific kind, or perhaps a root, of humanity's research. But if I've begun with sacred scriptures, is there a difference between a holy text and a profane one? A difference in how a text is printed and studied? Is there a boundary in the West, for instance, between scriptures and classics? Well, what we notice at once in this text, like the Lucan Pharsalia from 1486, is similarly composed of multiple text box of commentary. The traditions of scholarship extended with commentaries to works of literature, to histories, to scientific books, and so forth. Study is study. Characteristic again, again is how little of the text is on each page compared with a commentary. Gutenberg and his printing press, a change in technology, is often the hero of the story of the emergence of modernity. But I wish to focus our attention on the people who set texts into print, the printers who were compositors. For these great printers were also editors, designers, scholars. These two tasks, page design and editing, both required significant negotiation with past readings and with the task of reading itself. The innovation and dissemination of a second page design offers us access to a different kind of reading and writing and thus study. To make the opposition that I'm seeking, I turn now to Aldous Minutius, one of the heroes of the humanist moment. Consider this page, 16 years later, of Lucan's Pharsalia. What do we see? A single text block, uniform in shape, uncluttered by commentaries, by marginalia, by other texts, and certainly by other fonts. That's a long story about all this. The text in one language, squared, easily read by a single reader. We can all recognize this. This is the books we read. It's printed in order to be read by itself, with no explicit intertext, no links to other passages, no recourse to a series of previous readers. Indeed, this is the emergence of reading as a direct relation between a single reader and a text, and often the presumption of a relation to an author. If the commentary text presented a sea of thinkers and writers, a world of diverse minds engaged with a limited set of works at a time, the humanist page is the page of a solitary author. The reader, too, becomes solitary. An individual arises here who is not linked and called by a series of past readers, nor in necessary conversation with contemporary readers. The pure humanist text was the result of extensive editing and correcting, but the variants, at least in many editions, were hidden. This yields a new kind of study with a new reader, and its very clarity and simplicity hid the intricacy and scholarly engagement of the humanists. The text now becomes contemporary with the reader. If I may safely ignore all the previous readers, the arguments, the developments, the lines of debate over generations, then in some way I read at the very moment, not only of the current printing of the text, but in the time of its author. The authority of the text is direct, unmediated, time stands still. The text has become information, representing knowledge and settled matters. Such a text does not require a library, does not require a circle or a classroom. The readers can be solitary, learning to think on their own as individuals with an individual imputed author. This kind of page is, I suggest, the design from which the modern subject arises. Finally, this is a page one can read quickly. The work does not drive one around the page. Rather, the eye moves in a linear and easier manner through the text to its next page. It still takes some time to read, 
But the ease of motion creates a new velocity and a transparency, which we call information. The effort of reading is reduced. The text seems to answer immediately the questions posed, and indeed welcomes the reader into a solitary world. We read to the end of our single block book, which, uh, which awaits us now. There's no predictable ending of reading the commentary page. Indeed, no closure is possible. While scholarship requires endnotes and citations, in the humanities, the doctoral dissertation and the work for which one, must which one would receive tenure is a coherent, single authored text. This is how students are taught to write, and the epistemology of such book writing depends on a kind of immediacy and also a direct engagement with a work. Scientific articles may actually be quite similar. That's a topic for another night. Scholarship then shifted from a scholastic effort which occurs in a scholarly language which transpires on a complex page to a tool for the production of simple legibility. And it will lead to the translations into the vernacular, translations of scriptures and of classics. It is the humanist page that is the emblem of the accessible product of scholarship. These two different kinds of page, pages, the commentary page and the single text block humanist page, allow us to see how reading and writing are incarnate, living in the materiality of the things we study. And Eric, who will speak later, and much of the field of book history, explores these issues of design and materiality on other planes with great benefit. Reading and writing in these two kinds of textual environments is remarkably different. With the humanist page, both the reading and the writing occur in a kind of solitary authority. Other voices are quelled, and each reader has a chance to develop her own thoughts, to think for herself. With the commentary page, we discern an urgency and incompleteness about our reading. No commentator or editor is the final word on a text. No text was ever fully present, or rather, the present is overflowing, awaiting more readers. Reading is social. Thinking is learning to respond to others' questions and in some important way, open to future readers. There is an irony that the increase in the number of copies and hence also of readers also provided the path to a practice of reading that was less social and where thinking could be more private. The moment we call early modern offers us a textual graphic innovation as a key Recovering and then publicizing the original text is not simply noble, it is revolutionary. Its fruits were torn between classical languages and vernaculars, and between scholars and the emerging reading public, between sacred and profane texts. Torn is too polite. Books were burned, and many people were put to death and fled into exile. And of course, these conflicts resulted in the overthrow of churches, of states, even universities. I have simplified both the history of page design and the emergence of modernity. It was to accentuate how a change in study was bound up with a change in authority of readers and writers. Universities were indeed the battlefields, and the Reformation produced many martyrs among the ranks of scholars. One can tell the story of the modern university as a means of containing the revolution of reading, or tell the story of modern science as the emergence of thought, unbound from the generations of commentators, and in each case, control over who has access to information and learns how not only to master it, but also how to question and advance it, that's at the core of the university. For my purpose, we need only have a limited sense of the crisis linked to the humanist page and of the university that has emerged. For what we need now is to face our own challenge. The idea I now sketch, I will term the idea of discord, and I will draw from the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard. At the core of this idea is a recognition that the spread of digital technology has disrupted the central stories of how the university is the court for assessing the truth of knowledge. In 1979, 
this is one of these great little, I wouldn't say it's a factoid, but it's, it is a fact. The province of Quebec commissioned Leotard, a philosopher, to report on the status of knowledge. And the book was titled, The Postmodern Condition. Before email and the web, it was already becoming clear that data had begun to drive our society and that information was not reserved to our great libraries and our great learned institutions. Leotard himself was not overly concerned for the fate of universities. But he was a champion of what I will frame as an ethical task for the universities. At its core, the question was how to challenge oppression and exclusion. The promise that knowledge might have a role to play guided his inquiry. Leotard explored, again, all in the context of the new data and the new information technology. He explored how we tell stories to make sense of the world. And to pursue the idea of unity we serve a specific desire for a grand or master narrative. These are not simply plots or stories of events, but are framed to make sense of the knowledge we have in our present as a way of legitimating knowledge and society. He sketched three kinds of master narratives, which for the sake of unity, had placed knowledge in a coherent account of society. The first, a traditional narrative, identifies the current audience with the ones who are spoken about and also the ones who know and thus speak. We are the heroes of our own story. A narrative second of the right to knowledge asserts that all the people should have access to knowledge. We can enlarge to unite all people through the knowledge of enlightenment we bring. And thirdly, a speculative narrative claims that there is a deeper unity to all knowledge. We can bind all knowledge together and so bind all people who know together. Leotard argues that all three narratives and their direct descendants are no longer binding. That each narrative no longer holds the power to integrate society, to persuade people that this master narrative we can make, with this master narrative we can make sense of history as a unified arc. Thus, even the resurgence of populism, which somehow identifies our generation with the founders, still shows the strains and limitations in holding together the range of information and society. The second one, progress in advancing the right to knowledge, is intimately bound up with the formation of the modern state and its people. For Leotard, even this master narratives, even the ones from contemporary Marxist theory and from critical theory, with their promise of emancipation, can no longer provide compelling grounds. The strongest criticism of Leotard disputes his claims about the obsolescence of the second emancipatory master narrative, and then tries to reinscribe a critical dialectic of society bound in waves of ideology with scholars charting the longer narrative in service to the critique of ideology. We can present a critique of the university from the left with a keen sense that neoliberalism is infiltrating and instrumentalizing the university to subordinate all possible value of knowledge to economic efficiency. And this is a topic I will discuss more in the third lecture. But Leotard disputes the sense that there is a unifying dynamic in history to be discerned. Instead, sciences as descriptive projects of research are now called to justify themselves, but they do so with mini narratives. Knowledge in our time is not naive, but also does not have recourse to the master narratives. Instead, it explains its goals and its results through local narratives. The strongest forces that threaten the task of science are the demands for efficiency, for throughput, for speedy return on resources. Thus, the local, structure, local stories are structured to justify the resources, but often defer to an ideology of transparency and speed. The scientist cannot and need not justify the research through a master narrative, but still is offer, able to offer a set of rules or protocols that it addresses to those it wishes to persuade. It's not arbitrary or relativist, it is in Levinas' own way, dialogic, or as he prefers to say, pragmatics. As disturbing as this analysis is, it sparked vigorous backlash against postmodernism and against French theory. 
The challenges to the second and third master narratives perhaps do not feel as transgressive now. For instance, the colonial imposition of Western European science and culture throughout the world through the colonial universities, we now link to practices of cultural appropriation or even worse, cultural genocide. Our claims that the right to knowledge justifies our society now are seen to be exclusive of other traditions and indeed to aim intentionally to eradicate other ways of knowing. The third narrative, the speculative one, that's the philosophical one, presumed that the knower and the object of knowledge are ultimately identical. Philosophy now has abandoned the function of holding all knowledge together through a founding metaphysical identity. The idea of unity is no longer governing our, uni our universities. Indeed, with the eclipse of speculative philosophy as the ground for inquiry, the value of articulating any ideas for the university, like I'm doing in these lectures, becomes more suspect. Lyotard, however, articulates a new kind of idea and therefore a new task. If we no longer rage against or mourn for the disappearance of these master narratives that depend on the idea of unity, we might discern a new task. We now advance an idea of discourse. We seek to find our way in a network of social practices and forces where there are multiple and conflicting ways of justifying knowledge. Ultimately, the challenge is to explore and discover new paths from one body of knowledge to another without depending on a universal claim. This is not simply broken Humpty Dumpty but rather a series of profound gaps that reflect the limit, it even locally legitimated interests for knowledge. Leontard defines terror as the move that would silence, expel, or exclude speakers bearing evidence of other interests or other kinds of knowledge. He then articulates as a fundamental principle the negative goal that whatever rules, practices, and methods we do follow, we should aim to prohibit terror terror and silencing each other. Moreover, in his major work, The Differente in 1983, he changes the vocabulary. He explores how a damage is actionable in court. There are rules for adjudicating a complaint for a harm done to me by another, a kind of reasoning to make good a claim to know something that happened. But a Differente occurs when there are no adequate rules and hence no court, no tribunal before which I could bring a complaint for some harm done to me. This is a wrong, a damage accompanied by the loss of the means to prove that damage. Leotard examines the difficulty for survivors, especially of the Shoah, to describe to others the unimaginable wrong done to them. Another example he uses is the Martinican, who can bring a complaint against any infringement on her rights as a French citizen. This is 1983. But who encounters a différent where she to try to bring a case against France for making her a French citizen. The colonial crisis. So the new task of the philosopher is to bear witness to differences, to the places where we cannot yet find the words for a wrong, where it is not yet demonstrable. Here Leotard finds a decisive difference between an economic system and the theory of language he's developing. What is most significant for him is a suffering and the sense that capitalism is silencing the voices of the wrong. But the thirst for a universal history, for a universal subject with a real expression in political form betrays the différent, the incompleteness and the wrong that cannot yet find a way to present itself. Leotard proposes a different analysis and response, one that has recourse to multiple wrongs and modes of suffering with gaps that cannot be recouped by a speculative unity, what now might be called Intersectionality is, in Leotard's thought, the recognition there are many forms of wrong and exclusion. An economic genre as dominant silences many kinds of wrong. But there is no simple unity. Race, indigeneity, class, gender, religion, sexuality, language, histories, cultures, each are thwarted from making their claims 
in the court of efficiency, and where they might, would justify knowledge with economic gain. The university then could be the place where the intersecting discourses are given voice and the unheard and seemingly impossible suffering enters into knowledge. So I now claim this as the task for higher education, to learn how to bear witness to these differences, to hear the plea of the harmed. The idea of discord calls us to preserve disagreement, to recognize that the different practices of knowledge are not combined by a deeper agreement. What we strive to teach students is how to recognize the limitations of a specific regime of knowledge and to listen for the claims that pass outside of any given regime. The idea of inquiry is then found in this context as we seek ways to heed and respond for what is invisible in our own practice of knowing. Leotard focuses on the future of research and claims that we already recognize the hetero heterogeneous practices of the different sciences, including the humanities, and indeed of fields within the sciences. The loss of universality is not a collapse into nihilism or relativism, relativism, easy for me to say, but a shift to a different task, the witness to the lack of a system. The dialogue between the idea of unity and the idea of discord itself prompts us to see that the lack of unity is not the collapse of the university. The university becomes a place where that instability would be supported and encouraged. The idea of discord guides research into things unknown, not just to the discovery of a critical gap or challenge, but also the work of discerning new rules and new practices, new modes of knowing. Because information technology now disperses ways of access for learning knowledge, the university cannot claim to be the unique source not a universal history, but an ongoing search to exceed the local exclusions. The process of evaluating knowledge and thinking about how we judge the local justifying stories is something to be studied and learned. The battle to secure that creative instability, a home for research, also takes us into the kind of freedom of inquiry that the university requires, a safe haven from terror. Our students are postmodern, and they're not going back. They live in a world with many local narratives and systems and no master narrative. Born digital, they access information continuously and smaller and occasionally larger pieces, often several at once, and it is not clear that authority lies with the article streamed online from a newspaper or a blog post by a friend or a tweet from a star or even an email that got forwarded from one friend to another. Even a few years ago, we would have noticed that students have access to a great deal of information directly online. But students are also native on the Web 2.0. They're in constant conversations with their friends on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, sending email, maybe not as much, I'm told, almost continuously, tweeting on Twitter, reading and contributing to Wikipedia, blogging and news items. This is not happening if this is not happening on their laptop, it is happening on their handheld device, which used to be called a telephone. This story is, I'm afraid, trite, but not false. How do the tasks outlined under an idea of discord engage the students? What is the role of higher education in a world where the students are connected digitally? What can we teach them that will help them swim in the flood that they live in? To recap briefly, in relation to the reflection about how we know what we claim to know, the question is not so much to access information, but to evaluate and combine it, and most of all, how to criticize it. Those practices of reflection are not the same as looking something up. One might need to study classic texts, or analyze a contemporary viral debate, or study page design, or explore a recent advance in biological science, all with a purpose not so much of learning the claims advanced, but seeing how rules and practices create the claims and create their own field of research and knowledge. Research has that specific need for the unpredictable and teaches us how to define a question that is worthwhile and not yet explored. 
A research paper is not a blog. However, the research where the gaps, the differences, are made to appear and the search for new ways across the gap is engaged, this is something very difficult to teach, but might be a true justification for a university. Finally, the world of constant presence in our connections, where my friends are aware of my experience, often in real time, I hope nobody's tweeting this one out, and my followers get too much information in those tweets, with their 280 characters, poses key questions about the intellectual how intellectual collaboration will work. Will we have time to think? Does higher education take time? Does research take time? I dwelt on the past question of page design and reading and writing practices in early modernity in order to observe how the humanities in specific arose in the midst of a dramatic change in communication. I'd like to conclude this lecture with a reprise because the change in information technology will require a similar transformation of how scholars read and write. And here it is clear to me that while our students are out in front in social media, the scholarly traditions still have much to offer. Their practices are valuable for the new environment, and they also have that distinctive asset of long traditions, an awareness of the capacity to change and to configure past and present. I propose what is more like a pre-proposal or a call for a proof of concept for new thinking about three long-standing practices of the humanities can promote some sense of the future of reading and writing collecting, writing commentary, and editing. The first will be the practices of selecting what belongs in a library. The second will be practices of responding to specific texts. And the third will be sorting, reducing, consolidating the creative commentary work in order to publish new texts. I'll describe a project a group of, uh, that a group of readers I work with envisioned. This will give some concreteness to this set of practice. And then I will offer some sense of how the practices could become key elements in higher education in the world with new information technology. Scriptural reasoning is a practice in a community of scholars that's been meeting for about 20 years, primarily at Cambridge University and the University of Virginia, though with key participation at the University of Toronto and UBC. Readers from Christian, Islamic, and Jewish traditions meet in small groups and read parallel texts from the three scriptural traditions with careful attention to the complex meanings in each tradition. The scholars seek neither to find common ground nor to convert each other, but to explore each other's ways of reading and also to deepen their own understanding of their own tradition. This is a specific study in relation to the idea of discord, where the goal is not to find a deeper unity, but to seek new paths across the gaps between traditions. Some years ago, in conversations with some software developers, a few of us imagined an online forum for this activity. We were joining in a search of what I call the holy grail of digital humanities, a flexible commentary online platform. The obstacles were numerous, multiple languages, multiple alphabets, canonical texts, and hardest of all, recruiting participants. People my age just weren't there. The students are. The search continues. But in the process of imagining an online model, we recognize three distinct practices, which I mentioned briefly before. We would need to create a common library of the editions we wanted to cite and to comment upon, as well as the choice of the translations we would use. That library would also include traditional commentaries, lexica, concordances, scholarly materials, old and new. The question was not, in the first case, how do you digitize the materials, but what should be collected? Second, we would want a safe, semi-private, or is it small public, space for registering our comments and for responding to each other's comments. In real time and over time, we would want a wiki-like conversation or chat room or something of that sort where our group and maybe other parallel groups could read together and write our thoughts, both large and small. Comments might be on a specific word in its history or in a larger theme, for example, the writing down of diverse versions of laws or stories, or about our own commenting interactions. Third, at regular intervals, 
it would be desirable to have a smaller set of scholars edit these commentaries and present to a wider public the fruit of the commentaries. The fruit could be a single dramatic new insight, or it could be a debate between contrary opinions that required both sides. It could be a new reading that challenged established readings, or a program of questions that emerged from the comments. Precisely this reduced publication would allow for an unconfined, expansive, and experimental practice in the smaller circle of commentators, because the anticipation of later editors would free the discussions in this early stage. These three practices are each practices of the long standing in the humanities. They go back to the humanists of the early modern era and beyond. They are, however, capable of revitalizing in these new digital environments. And the humanities scholars are the most likely to be able to make the direct contributions to deepening the reading and writing of the future. While the idea of unity would seek a shared foundation or even a methodology for these explorations, the idea of discord is able to respect and engage the plurality of traditions and of languages. Indeed, the discord between them is a positive resource for this new kind of platform. Commenting on texts turns out to be one of the ancestors of blogging. The ability to repost, to offer my views, to criticize what others have said about another person's post is now unrestricted in our society. But what makes a good comment? What we saw on those commentary pages is an ur type of our screens with the various windows open. Reading is finding a way through these sources and commenting is adding our own voice. Machines can sort, bots can proliferate provocative comments, but the kinds of thinking that advance inquiry are naturally descended from humanities or humanistic research. Our disciplines cultivate the judgment on what is worth sharing. Can we teach that in the new context? The flood of comments and reposts so that people will have learned not only from ready experience, but also from the reflectful, reflective and thoughtful judgment with knowledge. The task of the university in our digitally mediated world is much more vast than these three humanistic practices. But our students and our society's future thrives in an almost unremitting activity of reading and writing. Higher education has unique responsibilities and capacities for teaching the kind of thinking that will deepen and transform the widely accessible information, that will limit terror, and that will seek to find new ways to discern the differences. If you'll forgive the pun, we should take a page from the humanists. We need to help our students design new protocols with this insatiable desire to read and write in these new environments in order to promote reflection and the search for new knowledge. One key feature of the challenge is speed. I'm almost out of time. The com almost done too, so you're safe. The commentary page is much slower to read than a humanist page. The current reading pace, faster still. Even though the time it takes a person to read a whole text might be very long with the constant jumping to other windows, the capacity to follow chains of connections away from the text, the kinds of reading and thinking and writing which scholars pursue takes time. Perhaps in part what higher education needs to do is slow reading and writing down. If we have rapid access to sources, this may allow us to give more time to thinking and questioning. In tension with a view of economic efficiency and productivity, one might argue that slow yields greater long-term benefit. The habits of reflection and exploration, the quality of judgments that create more valuable comments, these are the tasks for our universities. And in the next lecture, I will tend even more to the issues of time. How will we study? In collaborative settings, online and in local study spaces, commenting and exploring the limitations and seeking new ways to think what has not yet been thinkable. The university can hold together the diverse faculties and fields in their discord, elevating the new information technology. 
a home to the reinvented forms of study. Thank you.